Does consciousness transcend the body? For me, it seems like a lot of it boils down to intuition in the end, or maybe simply the way we've learned to reason or to filter reason through experience. In terms of forming functional models, hypothesizing, experimenting, doing science, it could be said there's no real use in forming an opinion either way. Maybe consciousness transcends the body, maybe not, but we currently can't really envision any testable hypotheses pertaining to this, so we should just do science on what we can. I would note that phenomenology has a scientific dimension. We can certainly reserve some for pure philosophy or wild drug trips, but in so much as we can kind of define and measure the textures or flavors of conscious experience, in so much as we can describe a landscape of qualia, we can explore this landscape by way of hypothesis and experimentation. So if we want to produce the best concert going experience possible, we can run a bunch of tests and say, don't ask Tuscanini to be the conductor, depending on your tastes. <laughs> And in studying your brain, we can see how those tastes align. Do you like Tuscanini conducting your concerts? Do you not? We can run the tests on the population entire, or specifically the population of concert goers, or the population of concert goers who also have enough money and time that weekend to attend the concert, and so on. We can scientize phenomenology in the way Sam Harris suggests when he says things like this. Uh, you can think about it in, t in terms of a larger story about your life, but all of this can be translated into a fact-based discussion about what's happening for you. And, and, and but then I also agree with some of his critics when it comes to the way he phrases it or perhaps the sort of self-assuredness with which he speaks of this landscape, as if it presents nothing at all mysterious or as if the narrative dimension Peterson refers to can be so easily constructed with Harris's much more skeptical, secular language. And it evolved over three and a half billion years, the three and a half billion years of life. And it built the nervous system from the bottom up. And it built this reducing mechanism that takes the infinite number of facts and translates them into a single value per action. It isn't derivable one to one in the confines of your single existence through pure rationality. It's way more complicated than that. Well, well, yeah, there's... I think there's a conversation to be had there. And one of the reasons I do deeply appreciate those two is they are having this conversation, albeit haltingly, slowly, talking past each other, whatever. They're having this conversation more than many others, as seen, for example, when Peterson and Dillahunty are just speaking entirely past one another. Um, so when we talk about the narrative... Yeah, that's a problem, by the way. Okay. Yeah, well, it's, you can't reduce the world to a set of propositions. Why not? Oh. <laughs> or when Peterson and Peugeot adopt a language, the more... Mm, mathematically or deconstructionally minded will just laugh at. A lower part, which is the, the nexus of possibilities, the coming together possibilities, and then this thing, that this logos, which comes down. So this nexus of possibilities, you could call it a mountain, a house, a temple, a body. That's Mary. Harrison, Harrison, Peterson and Harris are teasing something out here in a much more dialogical way, but enough rambling. Okay, okay, I speak on that soon in a video linked somewhere. Back to consciousness. What reason do we have to think it transcends beyond this vessel here of flesh and blood? I was saying there may be no point in forming an opinion as we can really only test things that function according to the laws of energy and matter we are aware of and can interact with. That said, the experiential domain can be described and modeled as we saw with the Tuscanini example, and as Harris articulates, that was sort of an aside, but the core question which I was trying to address is, is consciousness material? Is it tied to the chalice of the human form? Consider the default kind of skeptical or reductionist approach, which seems to have served us so well. It's an approach based entirely on saying things like, well, given what we have tried to study and measure and the results we were trying to get, we seem to have observed that X results in Y and doing Z results in Q, therefore we believe blah, blah, blah. It's all about utility, how much and how deeply a model can explain things for whatever function. Given that, it makes sense that the majority of scientists would be materialists, certainly naturalists. We can't really conceive of anything beyond nature, beyond the logical framework, beyond causality. We could conceive or expeculate, expeculate, but we can't really do science in this realm. That's why I think it always gets kind of furled back to the philosophers, in which case you're always going to get lots more creative, abstract, bizarre, nonsensical, hazy, and just non-scientific ideas. 
in order to adapt to that vision of the infinite, you have to imitate that which instills the awe, and that's represented by her foot on the serpent. Meaning ideas that can't be captured in scientific language, not necessarily ideas that are anti-scientific or contravene reason in some way, just can't be captured in scientific language, which loops back to the original observation. Whatever consciousness is, whatever existence is, it doesn't seem possible to describe in purely scientific terms. One needs to experience it, to be aware of it, to discuss it, to have knowledge of it, as they say. Consider music or the quality of something like wistfulness. Music is a simple one. You see almost immediately how we're getting into a more philosophical space when we think about music. You can describe a song mathematically, you can break it down in terms of vibration, intervals, frequencies. You can describe the sort of organism we are humans and the causal chain that led to our auditory senses and sensibilities. You can describe why certain intervals sound harmonious and certain ones do not. You can describe these things, but you cannot describe music. It cannot be contained by mathematics alone. I guess I'm sort of an existentialist in that I believe these things must be accepted as real in some more fundamental way. Music, truth, memory, thought, honor. These categories arise where awareness converges with material structure, and they can't be contained within materialistic language alone. Materialistic language is the language of science, and as long as we can agree on something, like we all want freedom to pursue experience, meaning, and fulfillment, then we can go about pursuing that via science. See Sam Harris, Alex O'Connor, and so on. Are there, there are experiences that are available to people and you know other conscious minds but they're not available to you given how you are right so you might not have the talent required to get there or the genes re required to get you there or absolutely the, yeah no right. problem with okay that. so the landscape of of possible experience extends what you currently know or even can know these ex these exper experiences exist right and they're radically different um and that there are right and wrong answers with respect to how to get from one to the other. It's not That seems functional enough, and perhaps it's all we'll ever be able to discuss, but we've always thought such things about existence at various stages along our civilizational knowledge train, and we've always found so much more to be discovered. Check out Donald Hoffman or Philip Goff. They come from kind of different angles, but they both have interesting thoughts. Also, the movie Arrival, holy cow, what's that about? What would that be like? I don't personally know what the truth is, but it does seem like consciousness is in some way irreducible. I think it certainly can't be described in scientific language that we currently use. That's the funny thing about physics. When you get down to its very roots, it's just describing things. It's just a system for describing not really what they do, but what they do in relation to one another. Is that all we'll ever be able to do? Well... In true existentialist fashion, I'd observe that that's the only sort of thing that can be discussed, observed, experienced. If you are the particles, you have no sense of separateness. If you are able to truly know the nature of the thing itself, then you have no representation, no separateness, no ability to regard it from the outside. If you embody the system's every particle, you are yourself the system. You lack all experience. This is a hard drive running in isolation. This is the entire universe with nothing outside to inject anything. This is God, maybe, but it's not experience. It won't experience change, will it? So, in this way, it seems like we have to presuppose a consciousness embodied in some finite structure. This is sort of what lets us discuss anything, identify anything in the first place. So that leads me to think maybe it's more intuitive to suppose consciousness preconditionally, that it's fundamental in some way and that, you know, so if it's emergent, then it's kind of emerging and bringing new dimensions of being into existence at certain points in space-time, at certain points when our brains emerge. Panpsychism would propose like, no, it's interfacing always, but here in these human brains, it interfaces in this very vivid, versatile way. It's always there. Uh, consider, it's very fundamental to matter, say monism as opposed to dualism, but it still has to transcend materialism as we understand or discuss it. Certainly, non-duality doesn't make sense if you dismiss matter, unless you're already some sort of nirvana god, in which case, how are you receiving the air vibrations transmitting my feeble thoughts? We can discuss the texture or complexity of conscious experience, but we never really touch on the actual observer, the witness, the fact that perception is 
fundamentally different than rocks just bumping into one another somewhere in space. It's interesting to consider, say, someone who has dissociative identity disorder, not something I know a lot about, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but every time they experience a new identity, is, is consciousness a pattern, a reflective interface? Is consciousness being multiplied? It wouldn't seem like it. Each time they switch identities is a discrete kind of node or consciousness disappearing and then appearing again. It wouldn't seem like it. It would seem like there's a conscious landscape or space abruptly being filled, textured with something different. Now, is the consciousness inseparable from that landscape? Does it just sort of flow along or inhabit matter as matter moves around and then boom, when it takes this specific sort of shape, it becomes this high level awareness thing that we call conscious landscape? Ha. Uh, frustrating. I'm sitting here realizing I've made no progress into the actual question itself. How could consciousness not be tied to the body? I've just considered the possibility of it simply embodying or being embodied by matter and then taking the specific shape we recognize as awareness, say, or human awareness. But I've done nothing to really propose how it might do that or why transcendent consciousness is any sort of alternative. It seems like we won't really be able to propose an alternative to the materially bounded possibility until we can do science unbounded by matter. I don't know how we would do that. We have to understand how the materially bounded possibility could or couldn't work, and we're not even close to that. I guess someone like Dennett would simply say that's like a grammatical or linguistic insufficiency, a perceptual trick, mayhap. What I'm saying is there isn't any official version in consciousness. All the time, our brains are tampering with the contents. They're revising them, editing them. Some things are being forgotten, dropped out altogether. And the question is, what's the version when you were conscious of it the first time? That's a mistake. It's a, a tremendously attractive mistake, but it's simply a mistake. So yeah, he might say it's really just like a mechanism playing out in various ways, but... That's an equally valid explanation if consciousness is fundamental or transcendent. It's just that it becomes a part of this mechanism, which might actually now make more sense because as an inherent part of the mechanism, consciousness is at least serving a function we just don't know of and has some sort of explanation. Whereas when tied to the human brain or some kind of emergent thing, it seems more like well, yeah, an emergent thing that's here now when the brain is sufficiently complex, but then gone. Gone before you're born, gone after you die. So in this way, something is actually sort of coming into being and going out of being, which arises materially, is completely embodied in the material process, but is itself not captured in material form or language. So under this view, it seems to me, panpsychism actually starts to seem more likely. Consciousness is fundamental, already there, part of the mechanism, and doing something we can't yet describe both versions, emergent and panpsychist, acknowledge that there's something we can't yet describe, but panpsychism proposes that it's sort of beyond the laws of matter and the natural law, at least internal to our universe. So whatever it's doing, even if it's doing nothing, it's, it's fundamental, external to the universe. Whereas the emergent view suggests that material natural law somehow produces the super material consciousness within it. This is just a lot of rhetoric and logic dancing I might be doing, but that just seems like an extra step. I'll also note that under the panpsychist view, even if it's not doing something to affect matter now, consciousness was an inherent part of whatever set this all in motion. And therefore it's unsurprising that however inconsequential it may be now, it's present everywhere and arises. Mm, this leads to kind of religious language, doesn't it? That's weird. I'm not a materialist anymore. I don't think the world's made out of matter. I think it's made out of what matters. It's made out of meaning. But of course, that's language, and maybe it's all language, and maybe it's all perception. Maybe the best way to understand reality is to get hit in the face with a fish and then think about it a bit. The trick maybe is in realizing we'll never kind of, we'll never be able to discuss consciousness without falling back into materialistic language. So when we're systemizing these things, we'll always fail to explain the fact that there's an observer to observe, an experiencer to experience. We may be able to describe its texture, 
I don't know. Stay away from Nirvana because then you'll lose even the materialistic language and who knows what that would be like. Who knows? <laughs>